I'd like to continue with the teachings on the uh, six paramitas. Suzuki Roshi, who is a wonderful Zen master, he died uh, quite a long time ago, but you may know his book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. If you don't know that book, that is a wonderful book. I think I've read that about 50 times. And he calls these the six ways of true living, which I think is great. The six ways of true living. So I'd like to begin by talking about exertion. And it's said that the essence of the paramita of exertion is a sense of joy to do what nurtures the root of happiness a sense of joy to do what begins to dissolve the roots of suffering. So that implies a certain amount of insight into what does nurture the root of happiness and dissolve the root of suffering. Since we are quite good at doing the other without even giving it a second thought, we're really like kind of experts at nurturing the roots of suffering. But it takes some insight to know what actually causes us to lighten up and to connect with the true heart of bodhicitta, to connect with our true nature, as it's called, and uh, to remember who we really are. It takes some insight. So you could say that perhaps the first step is the advice given under the teaching on prajna, which is that some sense of joy, exertion being joy, to uh, begin to study, listen, and explore the Dharma at the level of just uh, being thirsty for teachings and reading and listening, and a joy in doing that. And then uh, joy in contemplating what we're hearing about or studying, reading in books, contemplating it, and then joy in meditating on it. Which, as I explained, contemplation is more like you you have this question. Well, many of us take something like the word discipline and the contemplation. I mean, it's not artificial. It's really, truly wanting to know what is discipline in the sense of a paramita that takes you beyond the suffering of being caught in passion, aggression, and aversion. and What is discipline in that sense, rather than a rigid code that just makes things more unhappy? So you take uh, something like the notion of discipline or the notion of patience, or any of these. Paramitas are excellent ones to just read as much as you can on the subject in all kinds of places, listen to teachings on them, and then contemplate it. And contemplation in terms of this exertion, is everything from just going for a long walk and just thinking about it to actually um, ask yourself on the spot in your life, the exertion, the sort of sense of joyful exertion, that on the spot you say, well, what does the paramita sense of patience have to do with this enormous resistance I'm feeling right now or the enormous loneliness or depression I'm feeling right now, sense of despair, You know, in other words, when you're really in the darkest moments of either caught in rage or caught in depression or caught in immense self-loathing, that's an excellent time to contemplate. And uh, it might not feel all that joyful at that time, but that's the notion of exertion. It's like it occurs to you that if at that point you really began to wonder what the teachings had to do with your depression and how they could help, that uh, it's not exactly that your depression would suddenly lift, but it's like going in the direction of discovering the root of happiness. So contemplation has a lot to do with bringing the, especially the difficult situations of your life, right together with the teachings and wondering about them. So joy in basically benefiting yourself and um, knowing that by doing this, benefiting others. They say the 
kind of mistaken notion of joy as, you know, joy in benefiting yourself in a kind of indulgent way, which brings instant gratification, but a continual hangover that gets worse and worse and worse. So exertion without a hangover. And then finally, that kind of joy, sense of exertion towards meditation is this, uh, it's like a curiosity, joy to take these questions, these real life questions, and also just the meaning of certain words and uh, things that you've heard, bringing it to meditation, which basically means you sit down with a sort of question in your mind, but then you just keep letting the thoughts go and coming back to the present moment, coming back to the out-breath, and there's some sense that you're not really thinking about it. But that's when the insight starts to arise. And the insight doesn't always arise, that's for sure. I mean, you know, you fall asleep and your back hurts and lots of things, and uh, you get discursive about what you're going to cook for dinner or your latest worry, your latest plan. But there is a sense of bringing the Dharma to your meditation in sense of you come with a kind of question and then you just let the discursiveness go. And in the space, that's where the insights arise. So it's kind of this threefold process that begins to bring insight and then the sense of exertion grows because you really begin to know what is going to make things lighter. Maybe not instantly, maybe it's a gradual process, but you can see that it's making things lighter. And you already know really well what makes things heavier. So, joy to do what wakes you up. That's the notion of exertion. So it's like connecting with a spark of energy. They say inherent in every moment is this good energy, good life energy. So, you start out with just some kind of exertion in the sense of this joyfulness or this enthusiasm. I like that. But it's sort of beginning to be enthusiastic, but in the sense of making the effort to do what is conducive to developing this inner strength and what is conducive to developing a flexible mind. and what is conducive to development of trust in your basic nature, trust in the bodhicitta. So that kind of strength, what is conducive to that growing? So this is the notion of exertion. And uh, one of the analogies that I always liked is people say, like, exertion, well, that's like trying to climb up an icy mountain with slippery boots, with a heavy backpack. You know, you're just like trying. (laughs) Who was it in the Greek mythology that was always pushing that boulder up? Sisyphus, always pushing, Sisyphus, pushing the rock up, up, up. So it isn't like that. The more the analogy is like um, waking up in the morning in a cabin and it's freezing cold and you're going to do something that day that really appeals to you. And, you know, habitually, you just want to stay in that nice warm bed. But there's a sense of joy to jump out of bed and light the fire and get going with the day. And it takes a sort of enthusiasm there, or joy. So there are these three kinds of um, exertion in the tradition. They talk about the armor of exertion, the action of exertion, and insatiable exertion. And uh, the notion of armor there, it's interesting because I so often use the notion of armor as like uh, we armor our hearts, we armor ourselves, like barricading ourselves. But in this case, in this teaching, it means protection against hurting ourselves and hurting others. Exertion, this kind of enthusiasm or this joy to do what helps us rather than hurts us is like armor and so in this sense one of the qualities of exertion that's expressed by this notion of 
armor or protection is that exertion can be encouraging ourselves. You know, like maybe jumping out of bed is because the uh, meditation gong is going. (laughs) And you know on this particular day, the person who's supposed to come and get you if you don't show up for meditation is has gone to town. (laughs) And then there's that moment of like, shall I just stay in this bed? (laughs) So it might be that you want to stay in bed because you're depressed. And so you encourage yourself because you know from your own experience that staying in bed makes the depression worse and actually getting up and putting some cold water on your face and going to the meditation and starting to sit, actually something lifts and changes. So you encourage yourself. In the beginning, I think we do it a lot on just, uh, well, experimenting to see what happens. But the trust begins to grow in what actually benefits us and others. So that's the notion of exertion as a protection. And then the notion of the action of exertion. Usually in the traditional teaching, they talk about this quality of exertion as the sense of urgency. And uh, I think this is interesting that it's like uh, now that I'm over 60, I have this sense of urgency that I didn't have before. I mean, it's been growing since I was 50, sort of gets stronger, <laughs> where you actually have a real s- clear sense that you don't know much how much longer you have. And the sense of urgency grows that you don't want to waste one minute. But on the other hand, if that sense of urgency was like, beating yourself up, well, you already know that that's not how you want to spend the last seconds of your life. You know, saying, you must go to that meditation hall and you're bad if you don't, or any of this kind of heavy stuff, uh, self-denigrating kind of stuff. So it's just more the urgency that you don't want to waste a moment because you know you could use that time to um, sow the seeds of happiness and dissolve the seeds of suffering for yourself and others. And that's what you want to do. So the traditional analogy that's given for urgency is it's like if you are sitting somewhere and suddenly a poisonous snake lands in your lap. You don't think about it. Oh, I wonder if it's poisonous or not. (laughs) Or, you know, oh my goodness, look at the interesting pattern on it. I wonder why its tail is going rattle, rattle, rattle. (laughs) So you, if the uh, idea of urgency is you just see the danger and you just jump up. So um, Trumpa Rinpoche in his teaching on this, he said, when you talk about exertion, you also, usually there's a teaching on laziness, and maybe I'll, I'll say a little about that. So he was actually into the teaching on the laziness part. <laughs> and so someone's asking him about that, because one of the kinds of laziness is uh, just always seeking comfort or orientation. You know, just comfort orientation over what actually might give you strength. And someone doesn't quite get it, and they're asking him. And he says, well, you know, it's sort of like you're sitting around your California pavilion (laughs) by the pool, soaking up the sun, talking about Dharma with your friends. (laughs) And suddenly, a snake lands in your lap. (laughs) So, urgency. The other one is that your hair catches on fire. (laughs) So you don't kind of wait around to think about it. It has a lot of energy. I think that's the point. And finally, this insatiable joyfulness. It's interesting. uh, Again, when Suzuki Roshi teaches, he always talks again and again about practicing and studying with no gaining idea. And this uh, is that it's an unusual kind of exertion because it's actually not an exertion towards reaching a final goal or a final stage. It's basically just exertion for the moment, a kind of sense of um, just not giving up on yourself right now rather than so that later, such and such. So on the one hand, it is one of those paradoxes because the uh, exertion grows as you have more insight into what begins to dissolve the roots of suffering. 
and what gives you inner strength. But that's not like a goal in the usual sense because you never actually reach the place of full inner strength or the roots of suffering gone forever. What they say, actually, in the Buddhist path, it's interesting because there isn't just sort of like one enlightenment. There's like moments of deeper and deeper and deeper realization, stage after stage after stage of deeper and deeper realization. And then it's said, you know, even the notion of full enlightenment would be that then you begin to really live, rather than it's a sort of like a ending. So it's much more the notion of beginning to get the hang that every ending is a beginning, if you see what I mean. That you're always going forward because it's limitless. That's the point. It's insatiable because it's limitless. Like in one sense, it could sound sort of depressing. You could never do enough. But it means more like you could never live long enough to experience the limitlessness that is available to the human being. The limitless insights, the limitless compassion. There's so much that's available. So it's sort of insatiable. And not to mention the fact that if you make a vow to save all sentient beings, you might as well have an insatiable exertion because you'll never reach the end of that. One of the uh, four vows in the Zen is, you know, sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Desires are endless. I vow to put an end to them. It's sort of like paradox. So again, the notion of exertion here is with the threefold purity, and that's what gives it its limitless quality. If you have a sense of heavy-duty, one who's exerting themselves and the action of exertion and the goal of exertion, if it's all tied up with trying to achieve, you know, exertion is a big one in this doggy dog world that was being described, <laughs> misunderstanding of exertion. So in thinking about these paramitas, I was thinking about how in the traditional teaching on the four limitless ones, they talk about the near enemy and the far enemy. And I didn't say very much about that, but you might remember that the near enemy of compassion was like pity or sentimentality, and the far enemy was uh, cruelty. And so I was thinking that even though I've never seen any teaching on this, there's definitely near enemies and as well as far enemies of the paramitas, if you want to think about it that way. And I think the near enemy part is especially helpful because, for instance, um, the near enemy of patience can be just repression. Or it can also definitely be sort of grin and bear it, just endurance. And as you know, the far enemy is said to be aggression. I don't much like this word enemy, but I don't know quite how else to express it. could get kind of cute and say something like the, uh, the near message and the far message. And so with exertion, definitely the near enemy is like um, pushing through is what usually comes to mind when people talk about exertion, or if it doesn't come to mind, it's what you do anyway, even if you don't have a concept about it. So this is very different, very different indeed. That's what makes it a paramita rather than the usual kind of striving or, you know, just pushing, pushing, pushing. And it's said that the far enemy of exertion is laziness and there are three kinds, and the way Trumper Rinpoche talks about these three kinds is the first is laziness as a comfort orientation, which is, you know, sitting around the pavilion. And the second is a loss of heart. And the third is a couldn't care less attitude. And um, I don't have to say a lot about those, but I think it's helpful just to think of these things like laziness as just wanting to kind of deaden the pain with a comfort of some kind, 
Trump Rinpoche used to talk about going to the beach as lying in the dirt. <laughs> It's a, a Tibetan's view of people lying on, sunning themselves on the beach, <laughs> lying in the dirt. I think he never got it, you know, just never he could get it, what we were doing there. And um, I heard, I once heard a story about the Dalai Lama watching people smoke, and he would just like watch them. He said, "Well." Why? Why are they doing that? Like, what's going on there? <laughs> like, he didn't kind of get it. Which I guess is a good indication that he has no addictions. But, you know, comfort orientation, that kind of laziness, which is really wanting to just not feel the pain. And then the a loss of heart. I think that's a good one to think about. Laziness is just a loss of heart where you just give up. I think to me that's the most powerful one to think about in terms of exertion gone wrong, because this uh, striving kind of exertion just sets you up for loss of heart. But this kind of uh, joyful exertion or the joy to do what will help you doesn't lead to loss of heart. So in some sense, when there is loss of heart, one feels so. Dragged down and unable to move, unable to do anything. It's a very, very deep kind of laziness. I think we don't even call it laziness because it's so paralyzing. And sometimes it's in a lighter also. But I think the main thing is that if we work in our lives with cultivating this joy to do what develops the inner strength and the flexible mind and the trust in our basic nature. Then that kind of loss of heart will be less prevalent and more workable when it arises. And finally, the couldn't care less kind of laziness is, you know, just basically a kind of total unwillingness to change or do what will help. Sort of like you're depressed, so you get in bed, pull over the covers, turn the heat way up, and.、Uh, Basically, stay there for days and days and days. And if anyone tries to cheer you up or get you out of there, you just get mad at them. Or you know, another sort of combination of couldn't care less and comfort orientation is you know, just sit in front of the TV and、uh, drink beer and eat chips <laughs> until all the shows are off, and you're just watching the patterns on the, <laughs> and you just sit there and and there's just some sense of you. You just don't want to help yourself. So, I think the idea here is that if you work more and more with gaining insight through the reading and studying and through the contemplation and meditation, beginning to get insight into what really helps you to develop this inner strength and this flexibility and trust, what helps you to nurture the soft spot rather than cover it over. So with each of these, I think you know, like、um, with discipline, definitely the near enemy is some kind of regimentation. You know, like punishing your badness, or rules and regulations that are like regimentation and very rigid. And so they all have these、uh, qualities, and you could just kind of think about them. I think, but I think it brings up an interesting and more profound subject. To begin to think about what are their near enemies and far enemies is it brings up an interesting subject, which is that when we、uh, work with something like the paramitas, it's very easy to understand them in a lopsided way, which is to say, understand them in a dualistic way, a good bad way, and、um, that doesn't help. It doesn't help to think of them. As a, like an ideal, you're supposed to live up to, and if you fail, then then you're on the bad side. Because all that does is、um, brings you further and further away from any kind of connection with a soft spot or with clarity of mind. No insight comes from that kind of、um, being paralyzed by right and wrong kind of thinking. So what I mean by this is, the paramitas are more in the realm of, as I've said, again and again, they're more in the realm of paradox, or、uh, 
not so easy to pin down. Because, for instance, just to take aggression, if you look at the paramita of patience and then its opposite is, is aggression, if you say patience is good and aggression is bad, you're setting yourself up in some way. You're actually dividing yourself in half. You're setting it up for to be in a struggle with your own energy. But on the other hand, if you say there's nothing wrong with aggression, you see, that's also dualistic thinking. And then you're just, you know, you either want to say aggression is bad or there's nothing wrong with aggression. And you're only comfortable if you're thinking that way. Or patience is good or patience is bad. But these paramitas take you beyond that kind of limited thinking altogether. But of course we start right where we are with our limited way. And there's no need to be ashamed of that. That's just where we start. But we begin to relate to that in a very open way, looking at it with great clarity and with great um, compassion, just exactly where we are. And we apply these principles of patience and so forth, not to create further duality, but to actually begin to let us step more and more into a very open situation which isn't pinned down, which is much more uncertain, but much more creative and dynamic and true, the true situation, our true nature, which isn't fixed into yes and no. So usually we criticize ourselves for our undisciplined nature, or we criticize ourselves for our stinginess, and so forth. But there's a beautiful chapter in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Suzuki Roshi, where he actually talks on this subject. And um, to paraphrase it, he says something like, usually we criticize ourselves for our undisciplined nature. And we like ourselves when we're disciplined, and we don't like ourselves when we aren't disciplined. And he said, but you should realize that both this liking and this disliking are both Buddha activity. And in another teaching, which was very similar by Sakyong Mipam Rinpoche, he said, you should realize that whether you're liking or not liking, it's the bodhicitta trying to express itself. So Suzuki Roshi, he says, um, well, we like flowers and we don't like weeds. He says, but nevertheless, flowers wilt and weeds grow. (laughs) Unaffected by our opinions. Unaffected by our attraction, aversion, and prejudice. So, a real understanding of these paramitas implies that getting to know the whole picture is what it's really about. And so this is very interesting. I really encourage you to take any one of them, such as giving, just practicing giving, or practicing patience, or any of them. But uh, generosity and patience are particularly kind of usable. And, uh, for instance, if you start to practice generosity with sincere intention, sincere motivation to want to learn how to give and to give, and you say, well, I'll just start out by giving whenever it occurs to me, and then uh, I'll particularly practice if I feel attached trying to give that, and even if it's artificial in the beginning, I'll practice with the aspiration that I learn to truly give to truly let go, to learn to not hold back and give. So basically what will happen is that very soon, within probably the first five minutes, 
you'll become extremely intimate with your stinginess. And so it is with all of these. If you actually wholeheartedly start to practice them, you get to quite uh, familiar with um, impatience, lack of discipline, you know, uh, laziness, and all the others. Much more intimate with them than you would like to be. And so the idea here, which runs through all the Buddhist teachings, but as I said it earlier in one of the talks, is expressed so beautifully in the Shambhala teachings, and that is, without getting to know the nature of fear, one never becomes fearless. One never knows true fearlessness. And so it is with these paramitas. Without getting to know the nature of your holding back and your stinginess and your clinging, you never will know true generosity. However, if you see the stinginess and the clinging, and then you lay on top of that judgment and harshness and so forth, then you're still just kind of, you know, battling around in the dualistic way of looking at things. This versus that. But if you uh, know that you're, it's inevitable that you're going to see, you know, which you might call negative quality, if you get to know the nature of the uh, clinging with very honest, clear seeing, but with compassion, then you'll come to know true generosity. And same with all of these. You begin to practice patience and you become very familiar with aggression and you get to know the nature of aggression. And what I mean by getting to know the nature is basically that you you don't act it out, you don't act on it, and you don't repress it. This is a hard practice, of course. You're going to need all these paramitas to do it. But that's how you get to know the nature. If you've already acted out the aggression at that point, you catch yourself and try to just open to wherever you find yourself. So ideally, you don't act out and you don't repress. And meditation is the best way for training with this. And Tonglen is an excellent way for training with this. Because with Tonglen, when the aggression comes up, you can breathe in for everyone who's feeling the heat and pain and destructiveness and confusion of aggression. In so doing, you feel it completely with as few uh, storylines as possible, and you feel it for everyone, and you send out the aspiration that we be free of the root of suffering, and that we discover the root of happiness. So in this way, uh, you know, a kind of fruition of this would be like this poem by Thich Nhat Hanh, which is called, Call Me By My True Names in which he describes, and actually a lot of Thich Nhat Hanh's poems are a very beautiful, unphilosophical, very real presentations of this non-dual way of looking at things, not caught in the prejudice. And in uh, Call Me By My True Names, he talks about uh, the Vietnamese people being in the boats, having left Vietnam and out in the middle of the sea, this would happen frequently, and then the pirates would come and uh, murder them and rape the women, and uh, it was pretty awful because when they would leave, leave uh, Vietnam, they never knew. And you can imagine how terrible to just be out there with no protection, and, and if the pirates came, that was it. So in this poem, he says, you know, I am the teenage girl who was raped and threw herself into the sea, and I am the pirate that raped her. And the poem just goes back and forth like that about him feeling his kinship with all the players in the cast, not being prejudiced against one side or the other. And this, of course, begins with not having this kind of prejudice against ourselves, not dividing ourselves up this way, not struggling against ourselves in this way. So we always remember the um, discipline of not causing harm and the discipline of undertaking actions that help. So I'm not talking about uh, 
getting to know aggression is like permission to murder, rape, and abuse people, but more that we need to, as they say, make friends with these emotions in ourselves in order to not be afraid of them in other people and to not have the aggression escalate and escalate. So this is really how you can practice the discipline of not retaliating, patience, not meeting aggression with aggression. It's by getting to know the nature of aggression. So I'll just end with um, this good story that was told to me after a weekend on the teachings on the Paramitas, in which I had given a talk, which was something like this one, about not getting caught in dualistic notion of the Paramitas, but how they actually transcend that kind of prejudiced way of looking at things. So this man said that he left the weekend very inspired, and he decided that he would practice patience. And he decided he would practice patience right then and there in his car in traffic as he drove home through Berkeley traffic. So he said, um, and it's like we were talking about how irritating traffic is, so he knew it would be a great place to practice patience. He said, you know, he'd had a couple of people pass him and uh, cut in front and all these things that were very irritating, and he was just practicing patience. And then, you know, he went a few more miles and he got caught in traffic jam and, you know, they were moving about one half second every two hours, you know, <laughs> and he was practicing patience. And, and he was beginning to feel very inspired by his <laughs> perfection of patience. He got across the Bay Bridge into San Francisco and um, came down the ramp and he stopped uh, at a stop sign, and there was a crosswalk there, and this man was crossing in front of him very slowly, and he was practicing patience. By this time, he was, you know, it was really late, and he had to get home, but he was practicing patience. The man was going really slowly in front of him. And then the man turned and kicked his car. (laughs) And he said he lost it totally. (laughs) He just totally lost it. He just like blew up. And then he said at that moment, he remembered this teaching. And he said what was an initial response of I've blown it. You know, first he was angry and there was right along on top of that was I've blown it. He said what he did was he just breathed in and felt his anger. And and then he said, what happened is he just began to feel so much compassion for this guy, someone who was that angry, that miserable, that he was just kicking the cars of people that he didn't even know. (laughs) So I thought that was a great story. This is a good example of the threefold purity. If you hold an ideal, then somehow it does stand between you and the realness of life. And often it's when you kind of feel you've blown it, and the ideal crumbles into dust, that the insight really comes. I was told a story yesterday about somebody who had been practicing Buddhism for some time, and uh, their very best friend and roommate became addicted to uh, heroin. And uh, this was two men. And so the man who had been a Buddhist for a long time, he was applying all the Buddhist principles of uh, compassion and patience, and he was just putting all his Buddhist teachings into working with his friend and being patient with his friend and being uh, flexible with his friend and and so forth. And uh, one day he came home and his friend was face down on the floor in his own vomit, and he went into a rage and he just picked up his friend and started screaming at him and shaking him and they took him into the shower, and he was fully dressed, the Buddhist guy, turned on the shower, just was screaming at him and taking off his clothes and saying, I can't stand to see you going down the tubes. I can't stand to see you doing this to yourself. And he's 
washing him off, and, and he's standing there with his shoes on and all his clothes washing him. Then he takes him out and he puts him in bed, and he's just yelling at him that I can't stand this a minute longer to see you doing this to yourself. And then he left. And then the remorse that he had been so aggressive and that he had been so angry and so much remorse. And then the next day he came back home to apologize and his friend was sitting there on the couch and when he, when the Buddhist guy came in, his friend just burst into tears and he said, I never knew you cared about me. <laughs> and so that was him, you know, realizing that the ideal was somehow not as real as what sometimes really happens. So as long as we keep bringing it to the path, and the point is we start out with these ideals. That's all we have to work with. We can't wait around for the insights. In fact, we don't get the insights unless we work with the ideal. Like, if the man hadn't been working with patience, probably by the time he got to that point in the journey, the guy would have kicked his car, and he would have already been in such a rage about everything else that he never would have occurred to him to have breathed in. So we work with the ideals, we work with the threefold consolidation, but with the, with the notion of turning it around, moving towards letting go of the ideals and concepts and beliefs that we hold. So we start where we are, and then I think life is really what brings the insights. Particularly if we're practicing the study and the contemplation and the meditation, then actually the biggest insights come from the challenges of life when you think you've lost it. Sometimes that's when you've actually really understand something. This concludes Session 10 of Noble Heart, of Noble Heart, of Noble Heart, of Noble Heart, of Noble Heart.